It's both tangible and intangible, and it exerts great influence over our lives. It's been around for centuries, but in the last 50 years, it has changed dramatically. Do you know what it is? Hi, I'm Sid, and welcome to Democracy Rules. The media is the answer this time. Specifically, we're interested in how the media and new technology affect politics. Let's start with what the media and technology mean. What do you think? Hi, I'm Shavela. Can you tell me, what is the media? Um, I believe that the media is something that society uses for a source of information. I don't know, let me look it up. I think it's just like the newspapers and television and everything, the way words kind of spread around. The media is a venue by which news uh, can be transferred uh, all over the world. Okay, let's recap and define. In as few words as possible, technology is applied science to create machines or systems. Today, we're talking about the many machines available for us to access the media. Next, media is the plural of medium, which is a means of transmitting information. The media refers to all the ways of transmitting information. And mass media is media that can reach huge numbers of people all at once. So what does all this have to do with politics and government? Turns out, quite a lot. Let's check in with our resident expert, Senator Les Miller. Thanks, Sid. The influence of the media goes back as far as colonial days in our country. We'll talk today about the media's role with Howard Troxler, columnist for the St. Petersburg Times. Howard, thank you for being here with me. My pleasure. It. Freedom of the press is guaranteed the Bill of Rights. Why is it important to democracy to have a freedom of the press? Well, without freedom of the press and freedom of speech by the citizens, their right to, to speak and to read and to, to know what they want to know, the democracy can't exist. Uh, free press and free speech are the only check, the only way that government can work in a democracy. For all its faults, for all the crazy things that people say or that the flaws people find in the press or in free speech. Do you think the press goes too far with that free speech? Well, I think the press says a lot of things that I don't like, but in literal answer to your literal question, does it go too far? No. Okay. But people say things and people report things, newspapers say things, the media, the uh, uh, cable networks say things all the time that people don't like. People on the radio say things people don't like. But the essence of free speech is other people get to say things that you might not like. Okay. How do you define your role in reporting on political issues? Well, my particular role is as a columnist for the newspaper. There are a lot of roles that kind of get... Uh, I think mushed together in our modern uh, media, there are uh, commentators there. I mean, there are still reporters out trying to find out what the story is and write articles in the newspaper or and report stories on television. But I think that cable news especially has sort of mushed together the role of reporter and commentator and opinionator and uh, an expert and um, uh, and everyone's calling themselves journalists. I'm not sure everybody is. <laughs> how how are newspapers incorporating new media? Newspapers are trying really hard to, uh, to get to the web to create uh, new outlets for information, whether it's blogs or podcasts or uh, video. Uh, uh, newspapers now have video departments. Mm -hmm. uh, there's sort of a, a coming together of those different kinds of things, but they don't have it figured out. Newspapers, uh, in our generation, newspapers are going a fundamental change unlike anything that I've seen in working for newspapers for 30 years. No one knows what's going to come out the other side. No one knows what the news product is going to look like a few years from now. You've been 30 years and yes. you've seen a drastic change in, in newspapers. Is it more so now than any other time in your 30 years? Absolutely. I think newspapers for a long time in America, most of the 20th century, uh, had a pretty static role. They came out every day, they came on your porch, they were the news. And I think now in the last generation, uh, with the advent of 24-hour cable, and now with the advent of the internet, yeah. uh, citizen bloggers, yeah. more citizens are taking part now than ever before in finding things out and telling the newspaper what it ought to be writing about. Exactly, exactly. Of all these different media um, types, uh, news and politics is instantly available. Uh, what effect is that having? 
Well, the key word that you just said is instant, and that has both a good and a bad effect. Uh, the good effect is more people have more information or access to more information exactly. than ever. And again, a lot of times citizens and readers of the newspaper are telling me, look what I found, look at this government report that I found that you need to tell people about. Uh, uh, so that's the good thing. The bad thing is, again, the instant judgment that we are pressured to make. It started with cable news, but now even with blogs and the internet and video and everything else, uh, sometimes it takes a long time for the truth to come out. Sometimes it takes a long time for you or I or for the government to realize what the right course is. But we're under more pressure than ever because of the instant nature of this media to decide right now, today. And that's why our government, I think, has become more a government of, uh, of slogans and a government of what feels good or sounds good today with the focus groups and what people say good things about on cable TV as opposed to uh, the right course to take over several years. Yeah. Citizens today have unprecedented access to information, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we come back. What about politicians' access to information, Sid? Thanks, Senator. In a democracy, government is designed to reflect the will of the people. That means, for our politicians to be effective public servants, they need to know what their constituents want. Studying public opinion helps them figure it out. The term public opinion is used a lot but usually not correctly. Let's look it up at dictionary.com. By definition, a public opinion is the collective opinion of many people on some issue, usually related to government or politics. But in a country as large and diverse as ours, one public opinion is impossible. In reality, public opinion has become plural. It's the collection of the viewpoints of many different publics on many different issues. Public, a group of people having common interests, viewpoints, or opinions. Opinion is ultimately determined by the feelings and not by the intellect. Our opinions are formed from our life experiences and the people we interact with along the way. Families, friends, teachers, civic and political leaders, even historic events and especially the media all influence how we think about various issues. Could the media influence public opinion? Knowing the public opinion of thousands or hundreds of thousands of voters is an impossible task. So how do politicians get that information in a condensed form? With a political poll. Polls are a common way to learn how people think about almost anything, but political polls specifically measure public opinion. A political poll is usually a highly complex scientific process that delivers very specific information, but all polls are similar in the basics. They ask large numbers of people specific questions about a target issue, then compile the answers and analyze and publish the results. What types of questions would you include in a political poll? There are about 200 organizations that poll for political information, and the most well-known are the Gallup Poll and the Harris Poll online. Let's go to Senator Miller for a discussion on political polls. Thanks, Shavela. There are polls everywhere now, TV shows, websites. Are any of them worth our attention? Most of them are not really polls. Clicking on a website for who thinks uh, so-and-so is the best or calling in a telephone. It's not a scientific poll that really measures public opinion. So uh, most of the things that we now say are polls are not really meant to be scientific measures of true public opinion. So how do they work? A real poll uh, takes a, a representative sample of people to try to get a, a good estimate of how public opinion or public thinking is really running on that topic. Uh, and this is a, uh, it's both a science and an art to get a good sample that you really think is representative of what people really think. Well, what kind of information uh, do they gather? Well, uh, a good poll uh, that is well phrased can provide some interesting information about public attitudes toward things. A poll that is poorly phrased uh, can tell you whatever it is you want it to say. So that's why people uh, uh, don't trust them so much because uh, if a company X comes out and says, our poll says company, people think company X is great, uh, I'd like to see the questions. Consumers, that is the citizens, need to be much more skeptical about what these polls are saying unless they can see what the questions are and know exactly who it was that did the asking and who got asked. 
in some of these polls, do they, do they target certain people that they call, that their information that the newspapers Well, in politics, a lot of times, again, we use this term poll uh, in an abusive way. It means a lot of different things. Like a lot of times in politics, as you know, uh, people will start calling people at home and saying, uh, would it change your opinion if you knew that politician so-and-so had done X? Well, that's not really a poll. It's called a push, push. poll, which is trying to poison or change the attitude uh, of uh, the voter toward that. Now, in politics, though, it can be useful, uh, and polls can be a good tool if you know how to use them and if you're really trying to get a good poll to test <clears throat> public attitudes, what the public how the public perceive certain issues and what kind of arguments they would be willing to consider. And in that case, it can be a useful thing. Having said that, how important are they in the political process? Well, they are more important than they should be to the political professionals. All they care about is, are we going to win? And so their polls do two things. They tell them what the horse race is, you know, who's winning and who's losing at that point. And they also tell them uh, whether uh, the message that they are using right that day is working. You know, mm -hmm. they're actually tracking every day now in big races to see whether, okay, I said this, how did that go? I said this, how did that go? And I think that's ultimately unhealthy for the democracy. Briefly explain the margin of error in a poll. Margin of error is hugely important, and people should, if they don't know anything else about polls, they should know that when they look at a poll, that the margin of error means it could go either way uh, by that many points. So if I say to you, hey, this poll says it's 50-50, but the margin of error is five points, right. the very same result, it could actually be 55-45. One side could be far ahead, and we wouldn't know it. So the margin of error is, uh, is really an uncertainty factor for polls. Everybody should be aware of it and not treat if it says 47 to 40, like it's gospel. You've explained it perfectly. And I Thanks. hope that, that these young people understand that. We want to thank you for being with us today. You've, you've uh, really done a good job for us. And uh, we thank you again for being here and taking time out from your busy schedule. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you. Shavella, back to you. Studies show that people get most of their information about government and politics from some form of the media. And that's a fact. OK. Now we've come full circle. Once politicians know how the voting public thinks, they want to show voters that they are closely aligned with those desires. To do that, politicians turn to the most pervasive and powerful influence on the public today, the media. The media delivers all types of programming to millions of people 24-7. Even though it can be seen in many areas, politics is prevalent in news and information programming and has been that way since the beginning of TV. Prevalent, of wide extent or occurrence. I'm online at museum.tv to research the first time TV had a real influence on politics. It was the Nixon-Kennedy debates in 1960. For the first time, the public could see their presidential candidates as they explained their platforms and debated their differences. Nixon looked uncomfortable, pale and sweaty. Many experts say it cost him the election when voters chose the charismatic, well-spoken, and well-tanned John Kennedy to be the next president. How could politicians' television appearances affect viewers' perceptions of them? The media used to be limited to newspapers, radio, magazines, and a few major TV networks, all known as mainstream or traditional media. But over the last few decades, the media has seen an explosion in outlets, content, and audience reach. Alternative media is everywhere with cable TV, satellite radio, and the internet. The main differences between the two groups of media are availability and cost. Mainstream media is available to more people with less cost. Census Bureau data shows that there is at least one TV set in 98% of all homes in the U.S. And that's a fact, Jack. The newest media is, of course, the Internet. It's a web of connectivity that combines TV, radio, and infinite information sources. It gives ready platforms for opinions and connects people in new ways with blogs, podcasts, and personal web pages. All that, and it only takes an instant. No wonder so many people, young and old, spend so much time with this media. But here's a word of caution. You can't believe everything you get on the internet, simply because so many people have access to ad information. 
There are reliable sources, of course, you just have to look for them. It's amazing that in a high-tech age, radio remains a widespread and powerful media too, likely because radio is available where other media isn't, in your car, at work, or at the beach. The average person listens to about 20 hours of radio each week. Many people spend their 20 hours a week listening to talk radio, a form of media that can be humorous, informative, persuasive, or inflammatory. And like other media, it can act as a catalyst for action. Let's talk again with Senator Miller for perspective on alternative media. Senator? Thanks, Shavela. Joining me now is Brenda McLaughlin, broadcast anchor with ABC News affiliate WFTS-TV in Tampa. Thank you for joining me. Appreciate it. Good to be with, with you, Les. I'll turn the tables a little bit here. That's fine That's with right. me. That's fine with me. Many of the talk uh, radio programs are admittedly biased and inflammatory. Why are they so popular? Well, Les, I, you know, there's a marketplace of ideas out there. And, and uh, uh, conservative radio, f for example, uh, for whatever reason, kind of wins in that, in that marketplace. Uh, Rush Limbaugh just signed a new, you know, an multi, multi-million dollar, uh, it's a fraction of a billion dollars exactly. uh, contract. And that's only possible because he draws listeners. Um, it's not piped into your bedroom. Everybody has a knob, an on-off switch on their radio, and they can tune and dial to whatever station they want. So people are finding Rush Limbaugh. That should tell you something. Um, I don't see anything wrong with that. I think what's a bigger concern is if listeners fail to appreciate the difference between a news broadcaster, somebody who is held to the standards of journalism and, um, uh, and at least makes an attempt to present both sides of an argument or try to be unbiased, as opposed to someone who's essentially an editorialist, a, a, almost a radio columnist, an opinion maker. Um, so if you can appreciate that difference, then then I, I don't see the harm, and I don't know that there's anything to be done. It's just sort of uh, uh, people are voting with their, uh, with their radio tuners. Now, I've, I've watched your show and been on your show many times, and you have your hand on the pulse. Because of those type of shows, what effect do they have on the political process? Well, I, you know, I think they do have an effect. Um, but you also have to remember that, for example, Rush Limbaugh's ratings and Sean Hannity's ratings, these are two conservative broadcasters, um, far overrepresent the number of Americans that would describe themselves as conservative or Republican. We're still pretty much a, uh, a divided country in that sense. Um, however, because they have such reach, um, while I don't think they're changing a lot of minds, I think people that are already uh, sort of oriented that way find a, a radio station that, you know, that supports their pre-existing points of view. I think with young people coming up, uh, it does tend to uh, inculcate young people mm -hmm. especially uh, with a certain political orientation. So I think it certainly does, does have an effect on the political process. The other thing that is of some concern is again this notion, the difference between fact and opinion. Uh, going into the Gulf War in uh, 2003, uh, as many as 70 percent of Americans according to polls thought that Saddam Hussein was behind 9-11. And this is something that's patently false, but it was just a widely held misconception. And this was driven in part by media messages that were out there that, that were either saying that directly or implying it strongly. So the consequences can be significant. Right. Okay. Do websites like the ones that are put out by political action committees, do they have the same effect? MoveOn.org is a good example of that, which is a liberal leaning uh, organization, uh, political action committee. Um, yeah, they have an effect, but I, again, I think they tend to draw people who are, uh, you know, being preached to as the choir. Uh, they're, they're seeking messages that sort of confirm and bolster uh, their pre-existing um, points of view. Where they are effective, I think, and where they do have an effect is sort of as an organizing tool, a way for like-minded people all over the country uh, to get together and share ideas and, and perhaps mobilize in support of an issue or of a candidate, people that wouldn't otherwise go down to uh, some meeting hall in a church basement perhaps on a, on a Saturday night might be inclined to join uh, a group on the internet and have conversations and perhaps share ideas and even contribute money. 
It's interesting. A lot of these are, are, are many of are, are based uh, political talk shows show their biases and their website uh, sites show their biases and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more mm -hmm. as we get further in, into the, the conversation today. Shavela, your turn. The media also plays an important role in shaping the public agenda, which are the areas of society that government and the public agree need attention. And since the media chooses what it will highlight in print or on air, it is also very influential in leading the public in what they think about though not always in how they think about the subject. The media and technology also affect elections in multiple ways. First, the media makes it much easier for candidates outside our two main political parties to have viable campaigns. With greater access and outlets, they can appeal directly to the people and become well known. It's still a fact that how candidates come across in the media can make or break a campaign. These days, a smart media campaign is almost as important to winning elections as a solid platform. And a candidate that can speak in exciting sound bites will get more exposure in the media than those that don't. Soundbite, a brief striking remark or statement for insertion in a broadcast news story. Technologies such as cell phones and PDAs have also made news more instantaneous. A candidate's campaign staff can access up-to-the-minute news and statistics from virtually any location. And with cell phone cameras and internet access, any event can be sent to a news media minutes after it happens by members of the public. Of course, it happens with events outside of politics too, but presidential campaigns really show just how quickly missteps or errors in speaking can be broadcast across the country or played over and over on internet sites. The media and technology are on fast forward and we're all trying to keep up. But have we sacrificed any in the process? Can we still expect verifiable facts, unbiased reporting, and the whole story? Let's check in one last time with Senator Miller for his thoughts on that. Thanks, Ed. Brendan, we talked briefly about biases in the media earlier. Yeah. Reporters have their opinions, and I know you have your opinions, but how do you report the news objectively? Well, let me start by saying, um, if you had somebody in radio or television who had no opinions about any issues at all, you'd wonder if you, you should be getting your news from somebody so <laughs> empty-headed. You know what I mean? So I think you should operate under the assumption that, uh, that people you get your news from uh, do have feelings and opinions and, and impressions about things. Uh, that being said, the important thing, I think, number one, is accuracy. Right. Um, if you're scrupulously accurate in everything you report, then you sidestep many opportunities for bias. Um, secondly, though, you have to go out of your way to, um, to show the different sides of a story. I'm hesitant to say two sides of a story because usually it's more complicated than that. But uh, within the limitations of time, uh, you have to give, especially in a divisive issue, each side its due. A quick example here, uh, during the primary race, um, uh, there was a story, uh, Barack Obama came out and said that his number one priority was fighting Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, and went on to say he also feels it's very important to end the war as quickly as possible in Iraq. Now, one way that could be reported is by saying Barack Obama says war in Iraq is not his top priority. Right. You see how different that right. is? It's, exactly. it's factually true, but that's really not what he said. And if he had phrased it that way, that would make quite a different statement. Mm -hmm. So there's very subtle ways in which bias can be introduced. So the, the viewer or the listener has to be very sensitive to that. And again, to the extent that you can quote people, exact, say exactly what that person said, you can avoid a lot of those problems. And you, you basically answer the next question, is it possible to take <clears throat> biases? Is it an easy way to do that? No, there's no easy way to do it. Um, sometimes it comes down to trust, and I think that's how people sort of decide who they watch, whether they watch ABC or CNN or MSNBC or Fox News. It, it's sort of a comfort level. If you feel that you trust this person, then you can sort of relax and assume that they are giving you a fairly unvarnished um, version mm -hmm. of events. What should citizens expect from the news media? What should we expect from you? Well, again, I, I think they should expect accuracy. And, um, and, but that's not to say that some context isn't of value. In other words, uh, in the course of a newscast, what may sound like an opinion on the part of the news anchor or the reporter uh, might just be 
some background and context that helps the viewer understand uh, what's being talked about a little bit more deeply. Um, you've got to be very careful there because, again, a lot of issues uh, are, are loaded. Whenever you get into the realm of politics or public policy, you as a, a state senator, virtually everything you dealt with, you probably had people that were for and against what you were doing. Um, so I think a good rule of thumb, uh, at least from my perspective as a broadcaster, is if I make everybody a little bit unhappy, then I've probably done my job well. <laughs> Briefly, yeah. uh, now that technology allows for such unprecedented uh, access and interactivity, uh, is the audience role now changing? The audience role? I think so. Uh, the audience has much more control over what kind of content they can access. You're not stuck with three network channels now to right. get your news. Oh, You've yeah. got myriad internet sources and so on. By the same token, I think there will always be a need for trusted news sources where people can flip you on and understand that what they're getting are the most relevant, important stories of the day, and they're getting a, you know, a clear, unbiased accounting of those stories. I want to thank you for being with us today. I really appreciate it. I like flipping the tables on you a little bit. My pleasure, thank Les. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sid, Shavela, we're out of time. Thanks, Senator. Media and technology give us great access to so much information. Now it's up to all of us to use it. Remember, democracy rules, and you rule in a democracy. Democracy rules!